Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, whether you're live or watching on Catch Up or here in the room with us. I'm delighted to welcome you for a talks at Google. Uh, and today we're talking with Rio Ferdinand, somebody who grew up a precocious talent, a gymnast, a ballet dancer, and uh, a footballer. Uh, went to West Ham and became a Premier League star in the 90s. A couple of years of West Ham, he's off to Leeds. Uh, two years later, he's the captain of Leeds, having signed a record transfer deal, record transfer deal to Man United. And the rest is history, England captain, England caps, uh, the like of which you've never seen before. But we're not really here today to talk about much of that at all. We're really here to, to talk about uh, the book he's written, which is Thinking Out Loud, Love, Grief and Being Mum and Dad. So without further ado, please welcome Rio Ferdinand. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming, sir. Thanks for having us. So, look, I wanted to, to start off because in this book, you reveal quite a lot about your, yourself now and in, in the past. And I know a few, uh, you know, top sportsmen, and I know that you have to have a certain attitude to be successful in sport. And I just wanted to start with a little quote uh, from the book, which is probably a good place to start. Um, you say in the book, I'm not just cold by normal people's standards. I'm not cold just by professional footballers' standards. I'm cold by the standards of Sir Alex Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Um, <laughs> no, you know what it was? Is when I signed for Manchester United, um, my mum was in the, in the room where I was just signing all the papers, and I was earwigging my mum and Sir Alex Ferguson talking. And he was saying, well, what's wrong with him? Is he OK? Is he, is he unhappy about anything? doesn't seem happy, he's just signed for Man United. And she said, oh, he doesn't show emotion like that, he'll be all right, don't worry, he's happy, but you won't see it. So I've always been like that. Yeah. And, because I always used to be scared, if I really enjoyed a moment, I'll lose focus of what's coming next. And it was, it's been like that forever. And we, some of me and the old players, Vida, Waza and Carrick and all them guys, we talk about it and think, mm -hmm. we never really done open top bus tours. We saw teams getting promotion or winning A Cup mm -hmm. and doing open bus tours around their, their seas, yeah. and we never done it because I think we was maybe one not allowed, but two also we wasn't bothered about it because we right. was always thinking about what's next. The next what's game. Next. Yeah, and the it next was an obsession. And, and obviously that's something you think was really important, making you successful uh, throughout your long football career. Yeah, yeah, I thought you had to be hard-nosed with it. And I think even we won the Champions League in Moscow and I remember talking, Gannett, we have a party after in a big, like, um, in a big room, big hall. Mm -hmm. All the families and stuff are there, flown over with the team. and. I walked into the room and all I could think about was, where's the CEO, where's David Gill, where's the gaffer? And I walked in and I went straight up to uh, David Gill. He said, oh, Rio, brilliant, what a game, we've won the Champions League. I said, yeah, who are we buying next year? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, are you crazy? Like, what's the, enjoy the night. I said, yeah, but I want to know, we, go, we need to be coming back here next year, I want to win again. So, wow, that's focus. So he's just like, I don't know, you become obsessed. You, you yeah. get the taste of winning and it's just a beautiful, beautiful taste. And I mentioned there, as a, as a, as a very young kid, you, you obviously had a range of talents, your gymnastic, ballet, mm. uh, and so on. But was that focus and that, what you describe as being cold or closed, was that part of your upbringing as a child as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was always focused on what I wanted to do. I didn't care what anyone thought about anything. Mm -hmm. For instance, on the, on the estate I grew up on, to talk about going to ballet as a boy, was a, you weren't done yeah, often. This is Peckham so, we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, so, but again, even in my household, I, I knew that my mum and dad loved me, but they didn't speak about love. They didn't really show affection. My mum and dad, simple things like never sat on the same sofa, never saw them sat and cuddle on the same sofa. So I never had any idea of how to show affection and love in that sense. Mm -hmm. My dad's showing love to me was through traveling to work in North London, coming back to South London to pick me up and take me to training in West London. That was his way of showing right. me that he loved me. But right. I never saw the cuddly, touchy-feely mm -hmm. love. And so I never had that in me. Right, you never had that in you, and then it became part of being successful as a, as a footballer, I guess. Yeah, you can't show it. So if I saw anybody in the changing room, and I thought he, was, he looks a bit emotional, man, yeah. I don't know what... He's going to stop me winning, I'll get out. Right. That's the way I used to think. Yeah, yeah that's, it's, it sounds cruel, and, but in the changing room, if I thought there was somebody who was going to have any negative effect on yeah. us winning a game in training, a game on a Saturday or a trophy, they would 
kind of deleted really so it wasn't it was just the way it was in that environment it was a, a real because you you're fighting against all the other teams all the other players and you can't have no 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 people half wheeling and that didn't soften up for your whole career that was that was the same by the time by the time you kind of came to QPR in latter years yeah I think by the, the time I got to QPR it was a different it was different okay um because I walked into the change room at QPR and automatically straight away realised this is different to what I've been used to. Um, not just the size of the club and stuff, but just the mentality of the players was different. I was geared to winning every training session game, every single game of, on the weekend was right. geared towards winning. And you went about that a, a particular way at Manchester United. And QPR was sort of a less professional approach or just yeah. their expectations were realistic? Expectations enough. I knew going in was going to be less, but it was just the professionalism of collectively, individually was, wasn't at the standard that I was used to and so it became difficult and it, I started questioning was it the right decision straight away mm -hmm. and um, it turned out not to be because um, I was we were rubbish <laughs> okay well let's, let's not dwell on on, on yeah, that let's move on quickly point, I didn't come here to talk about that <laughs> let's move on from that. Um, slide down a chair like that I want to sort of move on to when you met Rebecca your your wife and you said at this point um, you'd, you'd reached the conclusion that you were in a sort of perfect storm. Every single formative experience in my life reinforced the same message. Do not trust anyone. Do not lower your guard. Do not let anyone come close. Do not open up. And that, in a nutshell, was the person you were when you met Rebecca. Yeah. So she didn't immediately see you as somebody that opened up to her. Tell us a little bit little about meeting with her and, and what turned you on to the fact that maybe this was somebody different. Yeah, she didn't like football, which is a good yeah. start. Um, <laughs> She didn't want to talk about anything to do with my career, didn't really have any idea who I was until her friend told her. But yeah, and I think that was a, a great starting point. And I think, think that when I came home from football, as we were together and years and years went by, she didn't want to speak about football, which was, was great. I think a lot of people would go home and people would talk about football and stuff. I wanted to just switch off from that mm. um, as much as I could. And um, it was, it's difficult because a lot of people think it's a glamorous life being a footballer's wife. Listen, there are great perks that do go with it, but there's a lot of, it's a lonely time as well. And mm. what she was willing to do was to kind of put one stage of her life on hold yeah. with the, the view that when I retire, we'll become a normal family and do things together. Because when the kids had their six weeks holidays, summer holidays, and they were free to go away and do stuff, they were going alone. Yeah. I was on tour in Asia or wherever I was with the team. Yeah. getting ready for the season, same as Easter, same as Christmas. I was training Christmas Day, New Year's the same. So that was all put on hold with yeah. the mind that there was going to be time when I retire to do that, but we was never afforded that time. Yeah, because you, you got together with Rebecca in, in 2000, I think. Yeah. And uh, you then started to th think about your retirement quite early, as you might expect, with somebody with so much focus, mm. have other business interests, restaurant, media career and so on. So you're moving towards that point, you've moved back to London, mm. playing at QPR, so you, you were really looking for the next stage to start where you yeah. were going to be much more part of the family uh, scene, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and that, that was the whole plan for, for many years, and so then all of a sudden, bang, you get a, um, a bolt out of nowhere that cancer and you don't know what to do, you go, and we were speaking before, you just yeah. go into a blur and you just yeah. don't really know what's hit you, and I'm from a background of, of sport where I can almost dictate what happens to yeah. some extent. Control all the control, controllables. Control everything, yeah. yeah. So, and then this was just taken straight out of my palm. I could have no control whatsoever. So can we talk a, bit, a little bit about this, if we may? So this is 2013, and, and she has, she's diagnosed with quite an aggressive form of, of breast cancer. Mm. So that must have been, and you have got, at that point, three young children. Mm. That must have been a real, real blow. And you say you went into a sort of a blur. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I was driving home, I remember. Perfectly, I was driving home. I was a ra a ra two roundabouts away from home, and then I remember Rebecca phoned, and it, her voice, voice was croaky. And um, she told me she'd been to the doctors. But again, I knew she was going to the doctors about a lump in her breast. But because I was so focused and in a bubble of playing football and so focused on being successful, I didn't even didn't even come into my mind when when she phoned me. And then when she said cancer, you, you kind of world just kind of stops, and you just. I don't know, it's hard to explain what happens. You just don't know. All you're looking for is, are you going to survive or are you not? Mm. So we went to see professors, doctors, etc. And you're asking the questions and you walk in and you're in there for an hour. And if anybody asked me what I'd come out of that meeting and, and learn or listen to, I wouldn't have a clue of any of the detail. Right. 
Right. Because all I wanted to know was, are you, is she going to survive or not? Mm. And if I didn't get a yes or no in that, everything else was irrelevant. Right. And you, you applied a kind of a winner's mentality t to that period. Unfortunately, she did, she did get through the, the breast cancer. So it, f it felt like you had got through that terrible time and you'd come out of it the other side. Yeah, and for a, a good period of time, I think it was 18 months, she was, she was fine. She was in, in recovery. She was, her hair was growing back, um, seemed healthy and fine. And then all of a sudden, bang, it comes back again. And yeah. um, this, by this time, I'd been back in London playing for QPR. And her sister called me on the, when I was on the way in to training and just said, listen, you better come to the hospital. Rebecca's been called into intensive care. Um, it could be cancer again. And I, by the time I got there, she was in a bad way. So, and then from then it was like six, seven weeks and she passed away. Devastating. So she, the, it, the cancer had metastasized into bone cancer and yeah, she, she didn't come out of there. Well, she came out once or twice to visit home, I think. But yeah. it, that was basically very, very quick from the diagnosis to the end for her. Yeah, it was. I mean, it shows the strength of, of, of character and of her that probably a 48 hours, two or three days before she passed away, it was my little girl's birthday. And she made, she, I don't know where she gathered the strength from, but to come home. Mm -hmm. And she half organised a party for her with her school friends and she came and was part of that last celebration of Tia's fourth birthday. And then it was three or four days later she passed away, but she had terrible nosebleeds. People, even people at the party who hadn't been told because she was quite secretive about it, they must have thought something was up. Right. And, and what had you told the children at this point? Because they're, they're pretty young. Hmm. And that's the difficult part. What do you, what do you tell them? Yeah. Do you tell them what the full extent and panic them? And because you don't know how long it's, she's going she's gonna to stay alive. Is she going to stay alive? What do you say? Um, and Rebecca was adamant that, listen, just try and keep everything normal, keep going to work, keep going out um, and taking them to school, bring them here every now and again, mummy's ill, but don't give them the full extent until we have to. And obviously that day came mm. where I had to tell them, yeah. I mean, that you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get a harder day in your life than having to right. tell your three kids that they're never going to see their mum again. So to have to do that is it's, it's not an easy thing. Absolutely. And then you, you describe in here how you have to pick up. You've got to nor, you know, try to get them to have some kind of a normal life. You had lots of friends and family around to try to help you. But initially, it was just like getting people out of the door for you and trying to get into some kind of a routine. How was it initially for you trying to manage that sudden enormous gap in your life? Yeah, you become the person they look to. You become the leader in the house um, and the, the only person and the focal point of their life. Normally they've got one or two, did two of you to bounce off. But being that person that has to organise everything, luckily I've had a good network of people around me to help. Mm. But, and I'm from a background where in sport, especially in football, it's like sheep. I go to an airport, I don't even yeah. look at a sign, you just follow feet. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just, you haven't got a doctor, the doctor's in the training ground. Yeah. So I've not, I've not got a dentist anywhere, the, the club sort that out. So when you've, get thrown into the situation that I was in, you've got to find those kids' doctor, yeah. the kids' dentist, when do they go for their checks, etc. Yeah. This is all on autopilot before. So there's so many different things, and then going to school, yeah. that you've got to get your hand on and make sure that you've got it all sorted out. But it's, yeah, it can be overwhelming, and that's when I, I spoke about in the book where you, I've never con ever contemplated suicide, but I'd always looked at people that had committed suicide and thought selfish people and never understood it. But when I got to this point, in the, the days, weeks, months after, I'd, I'd sat there a few times and understood exactly how and why they'd got to that point. I'd never, I'm not saying I'd ever con contemplate at right, all, but, I, but I could understand. Uh, and as I said, without the network of friends and family that I had around me, mm. you could see it's easy for somebody to slip into yeah. that state. And you talk in the book about reaching out for help and, and trying to figure out when you're ready and when your family's ready for that, can you tell us a little bit about when you first started realizing that you needed some help more than friends and family being around you to help with the logistics? Yeah, well, people always said, oh, you go and see a counselor, go and see a, a therapist. But um, again, that macho sport environment that I was born into and was, was into would just would always shut that away and say no. Well, I'm going to talk to somebody who hasn't been through it. It's like the only thing I could think about, because they sent us someone into the hospital when Rebecca was in the last few days. They sent a counsellor into the room. 
I remember when the lady walked out, Rebecca said, well, you're not going to see her again. Because she asked her, have you, have, has anyone passed away in, from cancer in your family? And she, she said, no. And the only thing you can liken it to is that going for a driving test with a driving instructor who hasn't passed their test. Right. And that's the way I was thinking about it. And so once I, someone asked me about the documentary, and I, I thought, yeah, this, is a, this could be a great journey for me to actually learn, and quite a therapeutic journey for me to go and see people. So I went to a widow's, widow's um, meeting with about seven or eight guys who had been in my position some six months in, some 10 years in. And you get, to, I just learned so much from these guys that had been in my shoes and walked my path already. For instance, just well, when is it right to take off your wedding ring? I was the only one sitting there with a wedding ring on. All of them were looking at me like I was mad, but everyone's, so mad. everyone's and I was thinking, you're crazy. Yeah. I'm not the mad one. You obviously didn't love your wife then if you took your wedding ring off. Yeah. That's how you think and you're judgmental. Yeah. But it's only with time and speaking to people that you start thinking, you know what, actually, it, it, certain things are natural and they are going to happen you're going to change your feelings are going to change even a relationship the, a couple of things you said there <laughs> kind of remarkable i mean firstly your approach to getting help was to make a bbc documentary that probably wouldn't be something that most people would do but what why did you choose having been such a self-described closed person you, you you basically chose to make a documentary about about your, your grief and your family? Yeah, I mean, I'd never Why? done Hello Magazine or OK and, and stuff like that with my family or come into my house type thing. I don't, and that was just so far from what I was about. But this was a, something that I knew would help my kids, first and foremost. They would be able to see, visual, visual, visualize something. It'd be easy for them to digest and understand me and the situation better, maybe. Um, men, help them to speak out because we're not natural at doing stuff like that no matter what environment you're in, whatever workplace you're in, it's just not natural for a man to kind of take down that barrier or guard and be a little bit softer. And I realised the importance of that and how important that could be. And, and just opening it up to more people. And I think it's... it's and what it does, and what it's done, is it's, it's enabled other people to kind of... I've, I've been in supermarkets, old ladies who I'd have thought would never even know who I am coming up to me and saying, listen, give me a hug. And I'm like, oh... <laughs> I <won't." laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was that appealing, but um, I've seen your pro a documentary. Yeah. I heard your book's coming out, and yeah. so it's enabled people. And what's it meant? To, you've, you've got some notes actually in here from people who say thank you for the documentary. Yeah. It meant lots of different things to those people, hasn't it? Yeah, well, and it is. Some people just haven't, haven't sort of come up to me. I haven't spoke for five years. My mum passed away five years ago. I never spoke. I couldn't, but I watched your programme, and I heard about your book coming out and it's enabled me to speak yeah. or feel free to speak and open. And that's what the purpose of it was. That's the most rewarding part of, yeah. of, of doing this. And so that forced you into this journey of like going and trying some things. And then the second thing you said there was that you found talking to other people who've been through exactly what you've been yeah. through the most helpful. So maybe tell us a bit about those stories yeah, that I opened think you up a bit. Obviously, the, the memory jar, anyone who saw the documentary, the memory jar was such a huge thing because I was finding it very difficult to kind of understand or, or, or work out where my children were mentally. Can you explain, so memory jar is this idea yeah, of so writing down memories? Yeah, so I oh. saw a girl from Child, Child Bereavement UK. I went to watch a, uh, some children having a counselling session, and one of the things that came up was that this young girl called Emily said that introducing the, the, the memory jar where you write memories of, your, of the person that's passed away and put it into the jar. So it could be her, the person's favourite colour, it could be anything, anything as small as that to the, the perfume they wear, etc. And I thought, well, I'll take that back to my kids because I, my boys especially, I couldn't, I couldn't get through to them. Didn't I know how they were feeling. And for a parent to not understand how your kids are feeling is quite a bad place to be. Mm -hmm. So once I introduced a memory jar to them, they was like, it just, everything just opened up. They became so much more happy talking about their mum. Um, immediately, this is her favourite song, singing her song, and just things like that just kind of open you up and think, you know what, actually, pff, I'm getting something, I can breathe a little bit easier. So that was a huge thing. But also, when I went to Ireland to see Darren Clark, who's a golfer, who there's a lot of parallels, he's a sportsman, he's, his boys were a similar age to my boys when his wife passed away. And he was the first person that actually made me sit and think, yeah, there is, there is a life after. And he was sitting there saying, listen, one day I can see you're not smiling, you don't look happy, but one day you will be. I'm living proof. I'm as happy as I was ever before. I never ever thought I could be. You're sitting there thinking that, Rio, I've been there, but I am happy. Trust me, you will be happy one day if you let yourself open yourself. And so at that point, that was the first time I thought, you know what? 
um, maybe I will be and allowed myself to be a lot more open. And I think if somebody had asked me before going to Ireland, will I be open in, and have a, a, a full-blown relationship with someone? Will I introduce that person to my children? Will I be public with that person? No chance. I'd have stared, I'd have stonewalled you and said, no way, I ain't doing that. It will never happen. I wouldn't do that to my kids. What will people think is a disgrace? It will say that I didn't love my wife as much as I, sh I should have. But he gave me almost that clearance to say, no, it, it, it is doable. So I think you, you start the chapter where you go and see Darren Clark by saying, um, I'm flying back from Ireland and I've got a big smile on my face. Mm. Uh, and it's a genuine smile for the first time. And there's also a sense, though, that he, he kind of made you realize how important it was for you to be happy again for the sake of your, your family. I think he says here, um, in the long run, your kids will only get through this if they see you smiling again. If you love your kids, and I know you do, you need to do it for them. Mm. Almost like that gave you permission yeah. to move on and start this, this journey. And yeah. the sense of the memory jar on your children is incredibly powerful. The, the family started to almost come to life again, really, for you. And yeah, that. definitely. I think he's just so right. And I, only now I'm, I'm, I'm a living proof of that, an example of that, that I actually can see that my kids are happier when they see me happy. Mm -hmm. And it, it is quite an obvious thing when you think about it. But when you're in that bubble, when you're in that situation, you don't see things as clearly. You need someone to sometimes spell it out. And that's why throughout the book, I always keep saying it's so important to talk, do you know what I mean? And to, and to release your emotions so that somebody can give you a bit of feedback yeah. so you then can learn again. And you, you said also your, your children were dealing with it in different ways. They're obviously they're different ages from 11 through to six. six. And uh, some were more open and uh, uh, talking about Rebecca, and some some were were not. But the memory jar brought you all together. Yeah, I mean, my my oldest boy Lorenz, he was, if you talked about his mum, he'd just walk off, yeah. get up and walk off, or he would just sit there and just look through you. And when you're a parent and you're trying to talk to your your kid about how you're feeling, and like because I was always approaching it quite without wanting to be, but it's almost a depressive tone. How are you feeling today? Yeah. Have you thought about mum? And I, did, I didn't know, but I realised quickly after the memory jar, if you can speak to him in a happy way yeah. and make him feel happy. Do you think what about mum and, and the jokes she used to send? Well, yeah. they're so much more open to talking. It's just that obviously it's a depressing thing to talk about. And you, if you take that into the conversation with the kids, yeah. they just want to run a mile. So it is the memory jar. And I think them seeing bits of it, I was lucky that BBC gave me a few edits of the, the documentary. Uh, condense into a few minutes mm -hmm. that they could get to see a few things, see me cry even. Because um, I, I tell them that, listen, it's okay to cry, but they need to see it sometimes. Yeah. So little things like that has been so helpful, and that's why it has been so important to, to, to write this book, but yeah. also the documentary. And the, the book is, is published this week, I think, isn't it? So Tomorrow. you've got copies at home, and they've, they've had a look at the fact yeah. that Dad's written a book. Yeah, they're like just this. happy that they're on the front cover, just asking why our face is on there. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they always want something. Yeah, they want more. Um, we're got, going to have time to take a few questions. So if you want to ask uh, questions to Rio, then please do uh, do come to the mics. And while you're doing that, um, Rio, you, you also talk in the book a little bit about the conversations you didn't didn't have did and did not have with Rebecca yeah. when when you know she was very clear that it was going to end for her. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you look back on that time now? Whether there are things you might have done differently? Yeah, I think. Uh, Again, because I was so emotionally closed and I'd never seen like love in a cuddly, feely way, mm. I could never show it. And the, the times that I've, I was up late at night, especially the early times, and feeling guilt and regret was about me. Did I show enough love? Did Rebecca know enough how much I loved her? I didn't allow her to speak about it, even death about passing away. What if she used to come out of, she, and she used to say to me, listen, if something does happen, I'm not here, let's talk about what happens. And I say, what are you talking about? And that's that sport mentality, uh, the defeat, you can't talk about defeat with this. It, it doesn't happen, I've never done that as, in my life. So I ain't gonna start now, and you're gonna waste energy on talking negatively, I, I can't do it. But if I had it again, and I'd, I was unfortunate enough to have the situation come again with my mum, not so long ago, I spent many days in the hospital talking about what she wants. Yeah. Writing lists, even her funeral, writing out everything she wanted from the music to the people she wanted there. Um, but I felt so much better and clearer. And I don't have them moments of thinking about what my mum would want now because I learned from the first time. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you had the, 
had the opportunity to put those lessons into practice just as you finished the book, as you say, with the loss of your, uh, of your mother as well. Mm. And you've also got a bunch of other lessons you think you sort of, very simple but very powerful lessons that you've learned through this, this process that you've tried to share with other people. Are there other things that you'd say, absolutely, people should do this more? Yeah, I think one thing is, is quite important as well is that is, is when you go to see the professor or the doctor mm -hmm. for the information of yeah. or diagnosis or what your next steps are, is to always take someone who's a little bit detached from, from you guys a little bit so you can come in and take information, take notes. Right. Like I said before, you go into that situation, you walk in, <laughs> if someone was doing a test and started asking you questions on what was said, you wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. You wouldn't. Because all you're going in there really for is, the, is an answer to your question, which is, is the person that I'm sitting next to going to survive, yes or no? And everything else around that becomes a blur. Yeah. And so, you, you, so if someone said to me, oh, did, what, did your, what did Rebecca pass, pass away of? What was the, the diagnosis? I would have been sitting there with a blank expression. I wouldn't have, have, a, have a clue. Didn't have a, any idea what had happened. But that's just natural. The, the mind and body just goes into kind of a mad, mad state and wants answers. Yeah, you can't possibly be detached from anything like that, of mm. course. And um, you, you say in the book, the heartbreaking thing is that losing Rebecca has made me more loving. And I think you can mm. see that from some of the things you've said, said there. So if you could go back to that bar in 2000 when you met her or whatever, is there any advice you'd give to your younger self or you would give to your children uh, now that's different, you think? Um, my child alone would have been better. Yeah, um, <laughs> it seemed to work pretty well. It worked, but it wasn't a good one. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, being more open and just making a person that you are with know and understand how much you do care about them. I think that's a big thing that I've never done before and I want to make sure that I don't make that same mistake again in my relationship, but also in my relationship with my children so they know exactly how much their, their dad does love them and care about them and discipline obviously, but yeah. with a soft touch. Discipline with a soft touch. Mm. I can imagine there's quite quite clear discipline in the house. Is that fair? Or yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, you also touch on in the book your relationship with your own father, and obviously that's changed again recently, particularly the loss yeah. of your of your mother. How's that changed you? Because you you've seen, you know, a, as a dad yourself, but also seeing the world through your father's eyes. Yeah. And that's been a great thing as well, from especially doing the book, is I've got to kind of work out why I am how I am, yeah. because I've had to look back at my dad's upbringing a bit deeper um, to find out why, how my emotions are the, the way they are. My dad was a very hard, mm. tough to talk to person. Um, discipline was high on his list, yeah. and again, he didn't he didn't show much affection in the way that was able to to be seen immediately. Yeah. So. It's just been good that, in a roundabout bad way, but I don't know how to explain that, but it's, since the, the tragedies that have gone on in our lives, my dad has really stepped up to the plate and become softer, become a great dad, um, the one that I knew was there, mm. but in a more visual way I can see it and the kids can see it and it's testament to him really. And I, I mean, I, even the little things, I see my sisters who are like 16, some twins, they sometimes answer my dad back with, or roll their eyes and things, and I think, whoa, you are lucky. Because <laughs> that weren't happening in my time. <laughs> so they, he, that just, he softened a lot yeah. for the, in the right way. It strikes me a lot of what you talk about now and you write about and comes through in the documentaries about men and like how we are and how we maybe should be. Have you got a bigger conclusion on that? You think about all of the locker room stuff and the, the training and the way you were as as a sportsman surrounded by men all striving to be brilliant at something there's something bigger here going on about about men maybe in Britain or maybe in the world it's hard someone else asked me this the other day and it's hard to answer it knowing without knowing the answer yet because I always think if I was a little less intense could come home and detach myself from the game um, be more chilled out about it be more emotionally open in and around a training ground or at home. Would that have been a negative on me being successful as a football player? And I grew up believing it would. So I was scared to do that. I wouldn't yeah. do it. Because all, all I wanted was to win yeah. trophies, whether it would be 
playing for Man United or win table tennis against one of the other boys, I had to win. So it's ob weird, obsessive maybe, but that's the, I think balance is the key. I think you have to find a right balance. And I think towards the end, later, when I had children, I probably had a better balance. Change you, yeah. Because at the beginning, if I'd lost a game and friends had come up from London, I'd just say, that, right, I'm staying in the room. You can do what you guys want. But yeah, um, In the book, you actually say that people would come up to go out for a meal with you, you'd lose, and you'd just lock yourself away until four in the morning. Is that yeah. really what you'd do? Yeah. So they come up and they go expecting a great night out, some nice, lovely food somewhere in, in town, and we'd lose or I'd played rubbish, not often, but... Um, <laughs> And then I'd go, um, I'd just walk in and they'd just know. And Rebecca would have told them already, but on the way home, they've lost, he ain't gonna be going out anywhere. So I'd just go in the room and just sit there and just look at the telly. Uh, and she'd walk in and I'd just go out. And she, it's just the way it was, I just, I couldn't help it. And it wasn't really to our kids that you, you come in, put your key in the door and you've got a kid there and you have to change a little bit. You've got to soften up a little yeah. bit, but still walk. The good thing about football is that there was a game three, four days later. So it only lasts a couple of days. Right. That crazy feeling of walking down the, the school path, or uh, you walk going to the local news agents to buy a paper and you're looking at the man behind the till thinking, you better not say anything. <laughs> I, I know you're a City fan, don't speak, yeah. please. So, and, and then you get the next game, you win, yeah. and that, that, that emotion's gone. And what's been the reaction from, from football fans to this, new, this private side of you that they've now seen. <laughs> yeah, it's broken down a lot of barriers. I mean, especially on social media. You might be a mank, I hate you, but you're all right. <laughs> I, I saw the documentary, I'm a Liverpool fan, put that aside, you're not about. So it's, it's broken down a lot of that, yeah. but because um, football's so tribal and um, it's taken something like this to maybe people to see a different side of me, but, but I understand it, listen. Uh, I didn't like Liverpool when I played, I didn't like Chelsea, I didn't like Man City. Um, I could go on really, there's a lot of teams yes. I didn't like. <laughs> but, um, every team, yeah, yeah. okay. But um, last chance for questions if anybody does want to come. Um, what about sort of now, what, what's driving you, motivating you today? You've got this whole new track of being the sort of go-to guy for men should have more emotions and grief and all of the, the stuff that's contained in, in the book. But you're also, uh, you've got a very successful t TV career, and you're doing other sporting stuff as well. So what's driving you today? What, what's next for you? Um, just to, to be busy. I think there was a bit of a defense mechanism at first. I said to my management company, listen, make sure I'm, I'm busy, I'm working hard to keep my mind off of the negative thoughts. Um, I've kind of got through that stage now, but I still want to remain focused and, and, and stay busy in the things that I like to do. And obviously the TV stuff's great, being a pundit. Um, uh, running the YouTube channel is great as well, but I just, I just like being busy and I like doing fun things and stuff that I enjoy and I'm lucky I'm in a position, I'm in a position where I can do stuff that I want to do. I'm yeah. not forced to have to do things I don't yeah. enjoy. Okay, and uh, we might come back at the end and talk about one of those things. Uh, Henry's here with a question. Uh, Rear, many thanks for coming in. Uh, uh, slight change of direction, um, if I may. Uh, obviously, you're in a highly successful team and you had uh, obviously a highly successful boss in, in Fergie. Um, that perhaps wasn't quite the case in terms of you know, your England career. Obviously, we never won any silverware for a good while. Um, what's your point of view on the England team today and the boss and looking forward to next year's World Cup? Change of tone. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> um, the England team. Listen, if I, was, I was talking to Stephen Gerrard the other day. I worked with on telly, who, um, who I didn't like for many years. Um, <laughs> He's kind uh, of all right. He's all right now, yeah. Um, but, and we were saying, I'd love to get hold of this England team. If I was a manager now, you've got all the rough tools of a decent team of, you've got pace, youth, hunger, aggression. Um, they're tools you'd love to start with and work with. Um, but it's about the manager putting it all together. Um, I'm, I'm from an era where they called us the golden generation. Mm. And on paper, we probably had the best players, a, collective pl uh, a collection of players on yeah. paper. But we didn't. We weren't put together right. We didn't produce the, the performances either, and we never never won anything. Um, I think it's too early for this England team to be considered yeah. tournament winners. Um, but in years to come, with what's coming underneath in the younger teams who are winning tournaments now, I think there is, with the right guidance, there is an opportunity for us to become a bit more successful than we've been. It's quite diplomatic. Yeah, it's, this is live, isn't it? So. Yeah. <laughs> 
Another question. Hi, Ria. Um, Hi. Going back to dealing with grief and, and the friends and family around you, um, my daughter's best friend's father um, died recently of cancer after struggling with it for a year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm finding it difficult to, to relate to her friend again, um, to know my position as, you know, because she comes for sleepovers and, and I'm, how do I behave? Do I remind her of her dad? Does that make her unhappy? Um, should I step back? You know, I, do you have any sort of advice for, for the friends and the, the, the friends, the parents of friends of, of your, your kids mm. that you've seen work well and, and, and what's actually helped your kids? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I think it's, it's important that you don't, like, when, you, when her name comes up, you, you don't stand like this and like a rabbit in headlights. I think you've got to be as calm and cool and collected as you can around the subject. But like I said before, I think talking in an upbeat, jovial way is key. And funny memories are probably a good starting point. Um, what they used to like to do, what we used to do, or if there's, you're doing something and you can remember that, their parent used to do that as well. What about when mummy or daddy used to do this? And just, I think it's so much easier than rather than saying, oh, how are you? Kids get scared of things like that. I think they clam up and close up and think, well, who are you asking me that? Why are you asking me that for? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just think that kids talking about their, their parents, I think is something that is, is needed. It's just picking the right time and making sure you do it at the right tone. Great, thank you. Cheers. Another question. Hi, Rio. Um, I just had a question about the world of football, because obviously it's been uh, your life, and but it's also a lot said about how it's you know it's a man's world, and you know it's quite a tough place where people don't show emotions. How was the world of football for you during the whole experience? Did it help? Did it not help? And do you think it needs to change? It needs to be more about showing emotions. Yeah. Well, uh, to be honest, Shad, the manager and probably Nemanja Vidic and Bobby Zamora when I was at QPR were the only people that knew Bobby I used to travel in with every day so he'd hear me on the phone so I had to tell him what I was talking about really because um, he probably worked it out himself uh, and Nemanja we used to have saunas and stuff together and that sounds a bit weird but we used to <laughs> in a controlled environment at, at, at the training ground we used to just have saunas and we'd talk so I told him but the managers obviously had to know but I used to find the training ground and being in the football club a bit of a place of well, it was respite, really. Mm. It was a place of relief, release where I wasn't being looked at with any sympathy. I didn't want that sympathy. I didn't want people to be thinking, oh, is he all right type thing, because it, that becomes a strain on not only myself, but everyone. So I wanted to keep that to one side. It was a place where I could go and relax a little bit for that hour or two uh, in the day. And because Rebecca wanted me to keep going every day to make sure things seemed normal for the children, it was a, it was a blessing, really, in that sense. But like I said before, it's, it's the balance. You want people to be able to show emotions as human beings, but if it's at the detriment of you winning trophies, mm. then there's the, the balance. And so I always wanted to win trophies, so I don't know if I'd have changed the way I was yeah. if it meant I wasn't going to win trophies. And let's come back to that balance then. We've just got really just one minute left on this uh, live stream. So uh, defender to contender, this is a way that you're channeling some of your aggression now. Just tell us a bit about, about that. The world of boxing. Is that next for you? Yeah, uh, weird, I know, but um, no, my management just had a phone call to say, listen, would Rio accept this challenge of trying to become a professional boxer? And when they asked me, I was like, you know what, let's go. And everyone I spoke to, you're mad, what are you doing? But I miss competing, I miss that one-to-one -one challenge. I, I lived all my life kind of competing, me against you, mm. number nine, number 10, whoever you are, me fighting against you to win in training the same thing every day for years and I've, I, I miss that com competition, I miss mm -hmm. it and for three years I've not had it. I've been offered to walk up mountains and stuff like that but I don't, I don't, that's, not a, that's not a man to man one to one challenge that I, I miss so I'm happy to get involved and mentally as well, can you do it? And I'm an armchair boxing fan so right. I sit there saying I'd knock him out, yeah. I'd, I, there's no way, <laughs> that, how easy, yeah. that looks so easy and then, but now I'm going to have the opportunity to find out how hard it is mentally, physically, right. can you get up at 5am every morning and go on runs and take pounds it's, it's a personal challenge rather than the next career you think? Yeah, I was, I'm, not, I'm 38 years old, I'm not going to be sticking around for ages trying to be, be a boxer, so, um, <laughs> but my kids are probably the people that are putting the most pressure on because my boy said when I told him, oh, that's a sick idea dad, wicked, brilliant, yeah. and the other one said yeah but don't lose it's embarrassing, Dad. <laughs> so, well, <look. laughs> Rio, I guess I think your kids are probably incredibly proud of you in 
so many ways and not just in the sporting arena. I want to say a huge thank you for coming and writing uh, what is a, an amazing, uh, amazing book. And thanks for sharing your time with us. Thank uh, you. Rio Ferdinand. Cheers. Thank you.